case somebody missed it today, maybe they're discouraged, look at them and say, the Lord's pleased with you. The Lord's pleased with you. All right. I want you to get that in your heart and in your spirit. <clears throat> Amen. All right, we're going to get into it today. If you're glad to be here, just say yeah. 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 All right, Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11. I want you to say this with me. Say, my life is about to change. My, life is about to change. my family is about to change. My, about to change. my, church, is about to change. my church is about to change. Amen. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be, may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies of the devil. You don't have to reach over and take anybody by the hand. Anybody by the hand. We're just going to pray, all right? This is going to throw me off today. You can't touch your neighbor, but we're going to be all right. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we're excited to get into your word. This is a word that you gave me a couple of weeks ago, and today is the National Day of Prayer. We're releasing this. Today is no coincidence. You know exactly what you're doing. Your timing is impeccable. It's amazing. When you put this in my heart, getting it ready, Lord, and now I see what you're doing around the nation, around the world. It's awesome. So, Lord, I pray today that you would speak to each heart that's in this room, everyone watching online, that you would encourage them, that you would bless them. We just thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in our lives. I want you to take just a moment and say, Lord, speak to me today. Lord, speak to my heart today. I didn't come to hear Joe. I didn't come to hear an opinion. I want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So speak to me today in Jesus' name. If you love him, shout amen. 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 Before we get in, you can be seated. Before we get into it today, let's welcome everybody watching online. Can we do that? Yeah. All right. So cool. I want to welcome you guys. So let's get right into it. What are two things that Christians know that they need to do, but we struggle with the most? The number one is reading our Bible. Anybody honest with me? Sometimes it's a struggle. The second thing is praying, right? So this morning, I want to talk to you about prayer. And we've heard it said that prayer is communication with God, and that's absolutely true. That's correct. But what does prayer look like after the cross? Because we understand now the covenant of grace, amen? So we have to know what that is. What does prayer look like after the cross? Now that we're understanding the, the gospel of grace, how do you and I pray? Do we beg God to do things? We have to understand how to pray correctly. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so I want you to understand this statement. Nothing happens on the earth without someone praying. Okay? Nothing happens on the earth without someone praying. Now I know this goes against the sovereignty of God, that, and I've had people argue with me about that, and some of the things that we've been taught, that we can't control God, we can't get God to move. They get really upset when you say, God's moving depends upon you and me. All right? So I want to, I want to walk through some scripture just to show you some things. So let's go to 2 Peter 3, 9. And this morning I'm going to lay the foundation deep, and then next week we're really going to get into prayer. But I want to just show you a couple of things. <clears throat> The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. Here's what I want you to see. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's so important. Let's read that together. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This verse tells us that it's not God's will for anyone to perish. Do we agree? Yes. It's not his will for anyone to go to hell, right? Yes. Is that what it says? Are people going to hell? Yes. But it's not his will, right? Right. right? right. So that means that you and I have a part to play. You see this? It's not God's will for anybody to go to hell. It's his will for everybody to repent. But if you and I don't do our part, are you with me so far? Yes. All right. It's God's will for everyone to be saved. But how many will be saved if we never pray and we never share Jesus? None, Right? Do you see the responsibility that we've been given? We can say, oh, I understand grace now. Come bless me, Jesus. I'm just waiting for you. I'm, I believe in the finished work of the cross. All of that stuff is mine. Salvation, all of it. Even prosperity is mine. All of it's mine. So we just sit back. But he says, you have a part to play in this. Look at your neighbor. Just point at him and say, you have a part to play in this. You have a part to play. <laughs> I'm going to get around the slapping people. You can point at them today. Right? It's okay. So I'm going to go back to this, my previous statement. Nothing happens on earth without someone praying. All right, 2 Peter 1, we're going to back up to chapter 1, verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So according to this verse, you and I have been given all things. Everybody say all things. All things, all things pertaining to what? To your life and to godliness. Now let's go to Ephesians 1, 3. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This is so cool. So if we have all things pertaining to life and to godliness, and God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, then that means that healing is yours. Right? Everybody say all things. All things. All things pertaining to life and godliness. That means salvation is yours. Restoration is yours. Abundance, overflow, prosperity, wholeness, joy. Somebody shout joy. joy. That's important. It really is. Now just say it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Is that what the word says? He's given us everything, right? Yeah. All right. Amen. Everything that you'll ever need has already been provided by the grace of God. Now let's go to Titus 2, verse 11. We're going to change it to the new living. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing what to all people? Salvation. Bringing salvation to all people. So we know that it's not God's will for anyone to perish, and the grace of God has brought salvation to all people, right? So why isn't everyone saved? Because not everyone has responded in faith, believing that salvation has been made available to them. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now I want to address something that's vitally important for us to understand. Prayer opens the door for everything that grace has made available. Okay? Prayer opens the door for everything that grace has made available. Let's put this next statement up on the screen. Grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. Okay? Grace is not opposed to your effort, but it is opposed to you earning it. This is important because some people say, well, I get grace, so I'm just going to wait on God to do it. I'm waiting on him to move in my life. I'm waiting on him to bless me. I'm waiting on him to heal me. I'm waiting on the miracle. I'm saved, so I don't have to read my Bible anymore. Grace has it covered. I don't have to come to church anymore. I don't have to pray anymore. Are you with me? You still have to put forth some effort because grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. If you think that you're reading your Bible to stay right with the Lord and you're earning your salvation, that's where we get into error. Does that make sense? So are you ready to go deeper? When we pray... We are not getting God to move on our behalf. Okay, this goes against, for some of us, what we've been taught. Why is that? Why aren't we getting him to move? Because he's already moved. The finished works of Jesus. Amen? Amen. He, he was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, and then he is ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. On the cross, what did he say? It is finished. It's finished. He says, I'm done. So it's done. Now, this is going to make religious folks nervous, and that's okay. You know I like doing that. When we pray, we're giving heaven the permit it needs to cause whatever you're praying for to manifest in your life. I want to say that again. When we pray, you're giving heaven the permit it needs to cause whatever you're praying for to show up in your life. Okay, let's go to Matthew 18, 18, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Because people get nervous when I make a statement like that, but I'm going to show you what the Word of God says. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. This is so important. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is the New American Standard. I believe the King James, the New King James, and some of the other versions got it wrong. And I'll explain it in just a minute. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound. It's already bound in heaven first. You see that? And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven first. So this order is important because you cannot bind on earth first and then have it bound in eternity second. It has to be bound there first in heaven in eternity, and then now I have the power and the authority to bind on earth. Does that make sense? Yes. That's where the King James got it mixed up, I believe. You cannot bind or loose on earth until it is first bound or loosed in heaven. Okay? So when I pray and bind something on earth... I am giving heaven a permit to bind on earth. Does that make sense? So let's just work through this. Is Satan bound in heaven? Can, his job is to kill, steal, and destroy. Can he do that in heaven? No. no. What about cancer? Is cancer killing anybody in heaven? No. no. Can demons torment people in heaven? No. So they are bound there, so now I have the power and the authority on earth to say I bind you in the name of Jesus. But it has to be bound there first before I can release it on earth. It doesn't work the other way around, all right? King James Version says it the other way around. That's why I don't believe that it works that way. It was just an error in the translation. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So when I pray, my prayer is giving heaven a permit to go to work. Now, if I never pray and bind those things, will they be bound on their own? No. no. 
It's just like people are dying and going to hell. It's not God's will, but if I never open my mouth and share my faith and I never pray for my family and my friends and the, the lost loved ones, they're not going to accept Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes. So whenever we pray, we're giving heaven a permit to go to work. That's how that works. So you have, we have to understand this. Nothing happens without prayer. So whatever you're, you're praying and you're waiting on God to do in your life, I want you to ask yourself, have I prayed about it? Whatever you're believing God to do in your life, I want you to just ask yourself, have I prayed about it? Have I spent time in prayer? Or am I just sitting back and I've become a lazy Christian because that happens? It really does. So I want you to ask the person next to you, say, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? It's so important. We have, we have to pray. <clears throat> Somebody might say, well, Joe, I'm not sure about all that. It sounds like you're ordering heaven. You're bossing God around. All right, so let's go to Philippians 3.20. Because I've had people talk to me like that. <laughs> Everybody say, here we go. I'm going to show you some really good stuff today. For our citizen, citizenship is in where? Heaven. Heaven. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Living Translation says we are citizens of heaven. So as believers, our thinking has to change. For far too long, we've been reacting to what the enemy is doing rather than being proactive. What's the world doing right now? Reacting to the virus, right? Okay. So why do we react? Many times it's because we don't know who we are in Christ, or if we do know according to the word, we don't believe it. Because a lot of people know the word of God and they can quote it, but they don't really believe. I want you to say this. Say, I am a citizen of heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. <clears throat> say it again. Say, I am a citizen of heaven. Now say it from your heart. I am a citizen of heaven. All right, I want to prove it to you. Ephesians 1, 19 through 21. You guys doing all right? Yeah. Okay. Your life is going to change. You get this down. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and here it is, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He's seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. So whatever you can think the enemy would throw at you, everybody just say, Jesus is above it. Jesus is above it. Cancer, he's above it coronavirus he's above it that's what this is saying amen all right so we're all right with that all right everybody cool with that let's go to ephesians 2 4 through 6 <clears throat> but god who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses dead in our sins made us alive together with christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus and raised us up together. I want you to get this in your heart and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As a believer, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Say this again. Say, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. Is that what it says? We're seated, all right? That means that we don't have to live in a reaction to what the devil is doing. He needs to be reacting to what the church is doing. Amen? We have to get this in our minds and in our hearts. We are citizens of another world. Say it again. Say, I'm a citizen of heaven. When I was little, the old saints of the church used to sing a song that says, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Anybody ever heard that? You have heard that. Good. Yeah. They were exactly right. <laughs> this world is not my home. We're just passing through. Amen? Say it one more time. Say, I'm a citizen of heaven. We are citizens of another world, so I want to ask you, is Jesus defeated? No. Sitting next to the, the right hand of the Father, he is seated. Is he discouraged? No. Is he depressed? No. no, he's not at all, right? He's seated in the place of highest honor, and you, are, you and I are seated in heavenly places in Christ. So we are not fighting from a place of defeat. We are fighting the enemy from a place of victory. Yes. You see that? <laughs> We're going to keep working through this. When President Trump sends an ambassador to another country, the ambassador speaks on behalf of the president, right? 
When he speaks, he has the full force, the full backing of the United States government and the president of the United States. So when he goes into the room, he says, I'm speaking on his behalf. He goes into meetings with authority and power backing him up. That's exactly how you and I are. As a believer, when you speak the word of God, when you pray and say what the Father is already saying, we are speaking with power and the authority of heaven is there to back us up when we say it. Does that make sense? Why? Because we are citizens of heaven. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm an, I'm a, <laughs> let me get this out. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm an ambassador of Christ. I'm an ambassador of Christ. I'm an ambassador of Christ. I'll get it out here in a minute. <laughs> now, here, here's the issue. If I don't ever get into his word and find out what it says, then how can I speak with power and authority? Does that make sense? How can I pray with power and authority? You can get angry at the devil. You can get upset with him. You can throw a temper tantrum. You can pout. You can do whatever. He does not react until you speak what the Father is speaking. Amen? Amen? So hang with me. I'm still laying the foundation. We haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet. So I just want to cover a few things. Why do we pray in the name of Jesus? Let's go to John chapter 16. John 16. <clears throat> and in that day you will ask me nothing, most assuredly. I say to you, and this is red letters, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have no asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Jesus is giving us permission to use his name. Now John fourteen twelve through 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my what? In my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Let's read verse 14 together. If you ask anything in my name... I will do it. This is why I always say, whenever I'm praying, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I'll say it not, not just at the end, but in the middle of the prayer, and Sam will think I'm done praying. So, oh, he's still going. Okay. Because <laughs> he's given me permission to use his name. Some people pray like this, and I don't want to nitpick or anything, but some people, when they close out a prayer, when they're praying for somebody, in your name, Lord. Maybe some of us have done that. And I'm not nitpicking, but he said, use my name. He didn't say use the word name. He said use the name, the word Jesus. Are you with me? There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So that's how he wants us to pray. He told us to. Now let's go to Matthew 28, 18 and 19. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That word all, I looked it up in the Greek. You know what it means? All. <laughs> Everybody say All. <laughs> All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus has all authority, then who is this devil running around that doesn't have any that has the church scared to death? If Jesus has all, there isn't any left over for anybody else. Until you give the enemy your authority that you have. Okay? Hang with me. If Jesus has all, there isn't any left over for the devil, right? What does it say? All. Look at the person next to you. Say, all means all. Amen. All means all. Jesus has all authority, and he lives on the inside of us, right? So now you have all authority. Right? Okay. Luke 10, verse 19. We're just going through this slowly, methodically. I want you to get this in your heart. Behold, I give you the what? Authority. authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy... And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. You see that? Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's why we prayed this over the coronavirus. We prayed the word of God, right? So here's what happened. Jesus went to the cross and he disarmed the devil. He made a spectacle of him. Crushed him under his feet, defeated him. He took back all the, the power and the authority that Adam and Eve lost. And now he says, my spirit is living on the inside of you, so now you have all the authority and all the power that I had. All you have to do is believe it and use my name, and you'll have whatever you ask for. Is that what we just read? Yes. All right. So I'll give you just an illustration. It's like you're, you're getting bullied at school, and these kids are taking your lunch money. All right, you're in, we'll say in middle school or something. You're, well, elementary, you're a little kid. 
<clears throat> these kids are taking your lunch money, and you're, you come home and your brother talks to you, and he says, you know what, when you go back tomorrow, you tell them, you tell them that you're my brother, and you tell them my name. Because he has a reputation in the surrounding counties that he's a tough guy, and he beats up everybody. He's never lost a fight. He's undefeated. So you go back to school the next day, and these bullies come up, and they begin to circle around you, and you just you, you look at him, and you say his name out loud, and you say, that's my brother. And you say his name, and the moment you do, his, their eyes get really big, and they start backing up. And they're like, okay, okay, all right, all right, we understand. That's exactly what Jesus told us to do. When the enemy comes against you, he says, you have permission to use my name because he's not scared of Joe Stevens. He's scared of Jesus Christ who hung on the cross, who was buried for three days, who resurrected and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And he says, when he comes to attack you, tell him Jesus in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give him praise. Amen. Amen. That's what Jesus did for us. He says, you now have permission to use my name. Don't get upset. Don't throw a temper tantrum with the enemy. Say, in the name of Jesus, I don't have to take this anymore. Sickness, disease, you cannot touch my house. As the pastor of this church, it cannot touch this church. Amen? Why? Because I have the authority according to the word of God. I have the power, and Jesus says, you can use my name. And whenever that sickness and disease and the enemy hears the name of Jesus, oh, okay, all right. Does that make sense? Here's my point. But if we never get in here and read what we just read, We walk around defeated and discouraged, still going to heaven, but Jesus died for more than just getting us to glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Colossians 2, verse 15. This is what I was talking about earlier. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over all over them in it. I want to read it again. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. That's what Jesus did. He embarrassed the devil. He disarmed him. He took all of his power away. Now he says, I have all authority. I have all power. And because I'm living on the inside of you, now you have it. Does that make sense? Do you understand that you are fighting someone who's already defeated? Is that what the word of God says? Yeah. So you are not trying to get the victory. You're fighting from a place of victory. So let's get this in our minds and in our hearts. We are citizens of heaven. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So now when the enemy attacks me, I am fighting from a place of victory, not I'm trying to really make it through this week. The victory is ours because of what Jesus did, right? He he said, it's finished. He sat down. He says, now you are seated in heavenly places with me. You're a citizen of heaven. So now you're fighting from a place of victory. So when the enemy comes, you say, you understand who my big brother is? And then you use the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So powerful. Every time the devil tries to attack you, all you have to do is remind him he's already defeated. That's it. So I want you to point to three people and don't touch them today. Just point to them and say, you don't have to take this. 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 So then you begin, when you understand this, you get this in your heart. You say, why am I allowing the devil to discourage me? Why am I allowing him to get me all depressed? Why do I have to live with this sickness? Why am I allowing this chaos into my family? Why am I living in fear of a virus? Because I'm living from victory, not trying to fight to win the victory. The victory's already been won. Amen? Before Jesus, if you touched the leper, you got leprosy. Before Jesus, if you touched anything unclean, you became unclean. But here comes Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he touched the leper, the leper became clean. When he touched the sinner, the sinner became clean. When he touched the sick, the sick were healed. See how it all turned? And that very same Jesus is on the inside of you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's on the inside of you. So sickness and disease is not supposed to contaminate the believer. We're supposed to contaminate them with his light. Amen? Does that make sense? We have to get this in our hearts. We have to begin to read the word of God and say, I believe exactly what it says. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, your life is about to change. I'm telling you, our church is about to change. This, God has us on to something today in the coming weeks. So you have to make up in your mind, I'm tired of living defeated and being discouraged all the time. I'm tired of waking up wondering how the enemy is going to attack me today. Have you ever thought that? We get trapped in that mindset, don't we? So we have to decide in our mind, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the first and not the last. Amen? Amen. 
I am blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed coming out. Amen. Everywhere I go, I'm blessed. Just say that. Say, everywhere I go, I'm blessed. Everywhere I go, I'm blessed. Amen. I've been called. I've been chosen. I've been hand-selected by God. That's what Ephesians says. He has adopted you into his family. Nobody gets adopted by accident. I accidentally adopted a kid today. (laughs) Sorry, Julie. Right? He says, I have adopted you into my family. He knew who you were. When you're in your mother's womb, he says, I knew you even before that. Amen. When you were being knit in your mother's womb, I knew exactly who you were. I've called you. I've chosen you. Just say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. That means that I have a purpose. I have a destiny. I have a calling upon my life. So I don't have to live in fear of the economy. Is the economy going to crash? I don't have to live in fear of a virus. Amen? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Somebody say amen. 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 <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. So here's what I want you to know. The devil should have fought harder to keep you from church today. Because you just say this, say, my life is about to change. Amen. That means that strength is flowing into you. Healing is flowing into you. Whatever you need today, it's flowing into you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're supposed to be talking about prayer today. Let's get back on track. <laughs> well, when we start reading the word of God, it gets exciting. Amen? I love it. Let's get back into it. Remember what many Christians struggle with, reading the Bible and prayer. The Word of God and prayer, I want you to see this. The Word of God and prayer is a double-edged sword. All right? So we have a sword, we have prayer, and we have the Word of God. Those two things is a double-edged sword. So we have to have the Word of God and we have to pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. That means my prayer life has to include this right here. It has to. Say this with me. Say, I pray the Word of God. God. Say it again. Say, I pray the Word of God. If I don't know his word, I could be praying for something that I already possess. A prayer that God will not answer in your life is something that he's already given you. And I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I've prayed like this before. I try not to anymore. But we say a prayer, Lord, please be with us today. He cannot answer that because he already said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's already with me. So I'm asking him to do something he's already done. And you're like, Lord, please be with me today. He's going, "Mm mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> okay have you read this joe are you with me and i'm not putting you down i've prayed that many times but as you get into the word you realize i'm asking him for something so i'm spending all of my spiritual energy asking him for something he's already done are you with me so my faith has to say he's with me all the time he'll never he, his word says he'll never leave me nor forsake me amen? amen this is why we have to know the word of god this is why we have to come to a church that teaches the word of god amen because the more that i'm fed the more hungry i become you get that? The more words you get every week, you're like, I got I to gotta have more. I want more. Somebody say, I want more. I want more. So with the new covenant, with the covenant of grace, prayer is saying to God what he has already said. I'm going to say that again. Prayer is saying to God what he has already said. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He didn't say be strong in your own strength. He said be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That means that we are trusting God for his strength, for his power, for his might. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the next verse. Put on the whole armor of God that you may may be able to stand against the wiles, the strategies of the devil. Spiritual warfare. Do you want to know what spiritual warfare is? I'm going to tell you. You ready? Spiritual warfare is you and I maintaining what Jesus already obtained. That's your spiritual warfare. You say, well, I'm in the fight of my life. Spiritual warfare is you maintaining what Jesus has already obtained. Now, hang with me. He obtained salvation, healing, deliverance, prosperity, right? On and on down the line. Our job is to to maintain our belief system in the finished work of Jesus. Does that make sense? I have to keep believing that that has all been made available to me. So now we pray from victory, not for victory. So how does this work? When you believe that healing is yours, you pray from that stance of victory, from that position, knowing that it's already been supplied, it's mine. Even though you don't feel healed. Right, Tina? (laughs) You did it. You're living it. You pray from that stance, having done all to stand. What's the stance? Standing in faith. Standing in that position. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? may be able to stand against the strategies of the devil the strategy of the devil is to knock you off of that stance into unbelief 
You see this? Everybody say stand. So you're standing upon the word of God for healing. Let's use that for an example. So you say, by, by your stripes, I'm already healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5, right? 1 Peter 2, 24 says you were healed. But when you pray that, here comes the enemy with that cough or with that the pain comes back in your leg, right? Or whatever it is. He's trying to knock you out of that position of faith and believing. Everybody say stand. stand. That's why sometimes when I pray, you'll hear me say, Lord, we're standing upon your word. It's not just a Christian little slogan. It's we are standing, we are in the stance, standing firm upon what your word says. The enemy tries to send all of this to knock you off of this. Can I tell you something really weird that happened? I don't even know if I was alive yet or if I was real little, but I remember it's in my grandpa's church. They were praying for somebody, came forward for healing, and they were ministering, I think, upon this. And he says, you know what? And he put his Bible down there in the middle of the floor, right up in front of the platform. And he says, stand upon the word we're going to pray for you. And they, they literally stood on his Bible, reinforcing what we just read. And whenever they prayed, they got healed instantly. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I'm not saying that's what we do every time. But whenever your faith comes alive, you're like, I literally, I am standing upon the word. By his stripes, I'm already healed because of what he did 2,000 years ago. Amen? Amen? That's how it works. So how do we defeat the enemy? By standing in that position of faith. When the sickness comes, by his stripes I'm healed. When the fear comes, he's not giving me a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Amen? You fight with the word of God. The Bible is your ammunition. A gun is worthless without ammunition, right? Many Christians are walking around without any ammo because we don't pick up the word of God and read it. Are you with me? We're trying to defeat the devil without any ammunition. He doesn't react to our attitude, to us getting upset. He reacts to the word of God. Does that make sense? Say this. Say, something is about to happen in my life. We're going to go deeper next week. I just wanted to lay the foundation today. But I want to show you how this works before I close. And then we'll go deeper next week. How do I pray the word of God? Because it's easy for me to get up here and say, just pray the word of God, pray the word of God. Okay, well, how do I do that? So let's check this out, Philippians 4.19. If you're experiencing lack and you need, we'll just say you need finances in your life. feels like just the stream has been shut off. Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all your need. There's that word all again. My God shall supply a little bit of what you need and you're going to have to work hard to get the rest. Is that what it says? <laughs> my God shall supply what? All. all your need according to to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. According is actually a musical term, chord, according, which means in harmony with, to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Whose riches? Joe's riches? No. Joe's bank account? No. Your bank account? No. According to his riches in glory. My God shall supply all your need. So we pray it like this, God, your word promises that you'll supply all of my needs. So I'm using my faith, believing that all of my needs are met. I'm standing upon your word, Lord, your word. And I just, whenever I'm praying, I tell him, Lord, your word says that you'll supply all of my needs. I believe that and I receive that today, knowing that it's a done deal. So now as I'm praying, I speak that and I release it. I'm giving heaven the permit on earth to go to work in my finances. Does that make sense? Yes. According to his riches and glory, my bills are paid, my family's fed. The rent or the house payment's taken care of. Amen? That's how we do that. Lord, I know you're going to meet every need that I have, so I stand upon your word. That's how we defeat the enemy. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the what? Increase. Increase. So now I pray, and whatever you're asking the Lord to do in your life, whatever the need is, you say, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, so this is how I pray it. God, you're a God of increase. He's not a God of lack. What does that say? God gave the increase. God, I serve a God of increase. Somebody say amen. amen. You're the God of increase. So do you see how this works? You take this now and you just read it and you pray this. You don't, don't even have to worry about it. I planted Apollos water. What, what this verse is telling you is God gave the increase. Your increase comes from God. So now I serve the God of increase, not a God of lack. So, Lord, I'm, I'm not supposed to be suffering in my finances. You're the God of increase. So I'm praying this, and devil, you have to leave me alone. Amen. Does that make sense? Look at your neighbor and say, so good. <laughs> so good. 1 John 5.14, we'll close with this last one. This is so good. Hmm. 
Old James Brown. So good. <laughs> I'm just having fun with you. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it, and I'm not going to dance. Now, this, <laughs> this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his what? Will. His will. He what? Hears, Hears us. How do we know his will? It's right here. It's right here in the Bible. So when I pray according to his will, he hears me. It's a promise. Have you ever felt like God's not hearing you when you pray? Let's be honest. Yes. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So you may say, I don't feel like God even hears me when I pray. But if I pray the word of God according to his will, he hears the enemy says, oh, you're, there's just a brick ceiling over you. Your prayers aren't getting any higher than that. Nope. According, I'm praying according to his will. I'm not asking for things just for me. I'm not being full of pride or being selfish. I'm praying in line with his will. And whatever his word says, whatever his will, will and testament, whatever it says, he hears me. Does that make sense? That's why we pray the word of God. Somebody say Amen. So I want to ask you this morning, are you praying according to his will? So now we have to find out what he's saying about our families, about our home, our jobs, our church, amen? Our relationships, our lives. So one last time, elbow your neighbor. You can elbow him, it's all right. Tell him something is about to happen. Something is about to happen. I wanted to go slow this morning and share this with you to lay a foundation. This is why we pray in the name of Jesus. This is why we pray the word because next week something is is getting ready to happen in your life. I have already started praying this for the last couple of weeks. God is getting ready to take our church into a mode of prayer we've never experienced before. And you're literally going to see amazing things happen right in front of your eyes because we're praying.